Okay, recording started, Tina. Okay, Commissioner Ba, did you have a question? Yes, where do I look to get the link for um, the comments? I didn't see a link on the on the screen that you have. At the it, Board and Commission, what link is that? Where do I go? Yeah, let me City pull of, that up. City of Chula Vista. Um, let's see here. I am going to pull that up again here in just a second. The link is on the um, the script. It's uh, chulavistaca.gov forward slash virtual meetings. Oh, it's different than this? Okay, we definitely need to update this. Mm -hmm. forward, forward slash virtual, virtual meetings. Virtual meetings. Okay, can, should I go ahead and get started? I think we're good to go, yes. yes. Okay, the time is now 510 on December 14, 2020, and I would like to call this meeting of the Sustainability Commission to order. In the interest of public health safety and pursuant of the Governor's Executive Order N-29-20, Members of the Sustainable Commission and staff are participating in this meeting by teleconference. In accordance with the executive order, the public may view this meeting online, but not in conference room C-101 in Building A at City Hall, Chula Vista, California. The city launched a virtual comment, uh, commenting port, portal e-comment comment, sorry, that uh, allows residents to comment and participate in the meeting for their own homes. From their own homes. You can find the link at ecomment at www.chulavistaca.gov or backslash virtual meetings. Your comments must be received before I call the to uh, before I call for the close of the commenting period in order to be considered. After the commenting period is closed, I will announce the brief pause to allow the commissioners time to read any comments that have been received. If you have difficulty or need assistance in e-comment during the meeting, please call 619-585-5766 and Economic Development Department staff will assist you. Would the secretary please call the roll? Certainly. Uh, Co-Chair Legaspi? You're muted, but we saw your mouth move say here. Present, present, present. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Rodriguez? Present. Commissioner Corgan. Commissioner Guevara Gluyas. Commissioner Ball. Present. Commissioner Richardson. Present. And Chair Mathias. Present. Okay, thank you. Um, the first order of business is the consent calendar. I will now call for a two minute pause to allow the public to submit any final comments on items in the consent calendar. And commissioners, as a reminder, please refresh your view on the screen to ensure new comments appear. We will also update this slide for the next meeting. Thank you.
Chair, we have no comments okay. for okay. the minutes. For the minutes. Okay, is there a motion to approve the items on the consent calendar? One move, we'll vote down with the Okay, is there a second? A second. Okay, I have a motion by Richardson uh, and second by um, Ed Legespi. Okay, secretary, please conduct the roll call vote. Commissioner, uh, Co-Chair Legaspi? Aye. Commissioner Rodriguez? Aye. Commissioner Corgan is absent. Commissioner Guevara Gluyas is also absent. Commissioner Baugh? Aye. Commissioner Richardson? Aye. And Chair Mathias? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, because the consent calendar passes unanimously. Okay. okay, so public comments is a section on the agenda for the members for the public to address uh, the board on items that are not listed in the agenda. I will now call for a two minute pause to allow the public to submit any final public comments. Commissioners, just as a reminder, please refresh the review, the view on your screen to ensure the new comments appear. Chair, we have um, comments on other items, um, public comments on other items, but not specifically in this um, in this section of the agenda. Okay. So uh, the next item on the agenda is item number two, uh, informational items, and uh, the San Diego Committee Power Update. The staff have a presentation. Yes. Let me pull that up. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you all very much uh, for allowing me to come and present uh, this update today. This is uh, Corey Downs. Um, and, you know, I will say it's just, right, there should be a presenter view that lets me view all the other uh, faces out there. Um, but, um, Thank you all very much for allowing me to come present this. Um, it, you know, there, we definitely took a lot of action around um, CCAs and there's been a lot of um, institutional work that San Diego Community Power has been creating. Um, and so it's a great time to come back and um, I, I envision we'll be coming back um, uh, semi-regularly to provide information as further activities take place. Next slide. 
Uh, and the, the one thing I, I always like to say is, you know, I am from the city of Chula Vista, not a, a represent or not a staff of San Diego community power. Um, we'll talk about their staff a little bit later, but I always like reminding uh, we're, you know, we're a member of San Diego community power, but there is a difference between staff. Um, so first, just wanted to start out with some basics for anyone um, who hasn't been following um, uh, this uh, effort since the beginning. Um, San Diego Community Power is a community choice aggregation program, uh, which means we're following the path that other jurisdictions around the state have taken um, and working together with other reach with other jurisdictions in our community to um, provide a an, an option for uh, residents who would like to purchase energy and will become the default energy provider for our community members once uh, the program goes live. So um, you'll hear me talk about some notices that will be going out um, and, and this will um, be an opt out for the residents if they would like to not participate. But um, because of community choice aggregation laws, um, San Diego Community Power would be the default for the community members as it rolls out. Um, it was created with an effort to increase local control. Um, this through San Diego Community Power and, and CCAs in general, um, uh, responsibility for purchasing um, renewable or purchasing energy um, instead of going to the incumbent um, investor owned utilities like SDG&E um, would now go to the boards of the CCAs. So in our case, San Diego Community Power, um, which is made up of elected officials um, and who follow Brown Notice Meeting Acts um, and are required to increase or to have public um, meetings. And, and so I think, you know, Right off the bat, there's a, a really big difference between um, how we're used to operating with our utility and what we're seeing from San Diego Community Power, uh, because all of their board meetings are public um, and they are made up of local representatives that are responsible to local residents. Um, I, it, it's just from a from a kind of an energy perspective, or an, I don't want to say energy nerd perspective, but for someone who really likes energy. Um, and likes getting in the weeds, um, it, it, the opportunity to uh, and transparency that San Diego Community Power provides um, is really a, a unique, uh, a unique benefit um, that we're seeing as a part of this. Um, that being said, it, you know, th there was that was one of the reasons, but the other reason is we wanted to extort that local to control to reach 100% renewable energy faster than the state was requiring that utilities get there. And again, exert that local control to provide more benefits to the local jurisdictions that are um, in our efforts to pursue that renewable energy. Um, but finally, you know, those are all very good aspirations and goals, um, but they all are founded or based on the foundation of a financially sound organization. Um, as you can imagine, um, starting up a new organization that is purchasing power and conducting all the regular regulatory activities that San Diego Community Power does. Um, it is not um, easy and it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and so, you know, similar to any other new organization, um, there will, will be a period of time where the organization will be building up financial reserves. Um, you know, they'll, they'll be, um, they, they, they need to have competitive rates with the um, other option that residents have because there is a choice. So it's always important to keep that in mind that we, we do have these really lofty goals of local control and you know clean energy, but it does have to be fiscally sound and we have to make sure that it's something um, that that will um, be fiscally sustainable as well as environmentally sustainable. Uh, next slide. Oh, and sorry. Um, and then the last element here that the best element actually is the new logo for San Diego Community mm -hmm. Power. Um, there was a, a consult or they have a consultant who's been working to roll out some logos and other efforts. And, and this was one that was recently approved. Um, I, I definitely, um, I think it, it looks really great. It looks different than other community um, uh, CCA logos. Um, and I, you know, if you um, at the end, I'll share a link for their website and they have the recording of the presentation where they went into this and. Um, if you're interested, I would encourage you to take a look at that because they do go through a whole walk the, the board members through a, a presentation that explains why they picked this and the reasoning behind it. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of great value behind that. Hopefully it will resonate with the community. You know, it's kind of, uh, they, they were going for a little bit like, like an on button um, or like a, a an art or a miles, a speedometer kind of powering up there. Um, but 
overall, like I said, I, I think it looks really great and I'm really excited to uh, see the additional resources that will be coming out in the community as San Diego Community Power kind of takes on more of their own branding and starts building that brand identity. Next slide. Um, I think it's important to provide information about the existing meetings that are taking place. Um, there you can see our, our board members uh, being sworn in when we could hold in person meetings. Now they are holding uh, remote meetings as a lot of other jurisdictions, um, but they are still meeting the 4th Thursday of every month at 5 o'clock um, and the web uh, participation information is on their website or their agendas, which I'll share a link to at the end. Um, additionally, the uh, finance and risk management committee, as well as community advisory committee are a wealth of information. Um, and they regularly receive uh, reports from San Diego Community Power consultants and staff um, before they are presented to the board of directors. So it's a, another really great opportunity to um, learn about the um, decisions that the board of the board members are going to be making um, and provide input on those decisions before they even um, the, or reach the, the board of directors. Um, again, so I think, you know, that's a, a really great opportunity to increase that transparency and um, bring the public into some more of these meetings, especially, I mean, I was going to say, especially the finance, um, but I actually, as someone who's participated in both, I can say they both have very active and engaging conversations um, and, and really dig into some really important issues. So, um, you know, it's, it's just, like I said, great to see that transparency and, and the public being kind of brought into the room where the decisions are happening. Next slide. So some of the, the big kind of upcoming um, and some of the recent work that they've been working, San Diego Community Power has been working on um, is uh, designed around a launching service. Um, and so, you know, there's still some um, areas where they need to kind of nail down um, what they're gonna be providing and let residents or let um, phase one customers know about potential rates and whatnot. Uh, but they have let us know that there's gonna be a 15% default renewable energy um, uh, product that is offered, you know, that's the default, that's what everyone will receive. Uh, but then there also will be an opportunity for uh, individuals to select up to 100% renewable energy if uh, they would like to utilize clean renewable energy to meet their own sustainability goals. Um, as, a, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the organization has a goal to bring up everyone to that 100%, but it will take um, a few years to reach that goal. And so right now we're, we're allowing individuals to opt up if they'd like to, or if entire communities would like to opt up for their community members, they can do that as well. Uh, that isn't something that we've been looking to do for Chula Vista. Uh, but for some other community members, um, I think Encinitas has, has expressed some interest in that. Um, and so, there, you know, there is some of the opportunity to, again, again, exert that local control. And then, um, you know, the really important piece will be, when will this be available for residents to take advantage of? Um, on, on the slide here, we have the phase one accounts, which are um, mainly municipal accounts, but also some what they're calling quasi municipal accounts, uh, school districts, water districts, et cetera who will be um, the first customers to enroll. Uh, and I, I think it's also important to, to note that with a, um, uh, a, uh, an, an enrollment of the size of San Diego Community Powers, it's very common to do three phases. So this aligns what, with what other large CCAs have, been, have done uh, with an effort of you know, making sure, starting small, making sure all the transition uh, mechanics are in order, that every, you know, all of the, the processes are working smoothly, um, with those municipal accounts, get everything worked out, and then they'll gradually bring in more customers, starting with the uh, phase two of large commercial customers starting in June of next year. And then um, NEM or net energy metering customers and the remaining mainly residential accounts um, beginning in January of 2022. Um, the, the NEM net energy metering accounts are for any account that currently has a solar uh, or solar and is um, under a different net energy metering rate. Uh, because of the complexity of those specific accounts, they're going to be enrolled in the uh, the third phase. Um, but it will be the, the rollout schedule. And if, if anything changes, we'll, we'll definitely be um, notifying you. And also everyone who would be affected by this will be notified by San Diego Community Power. They will receive two enrollment notices before the launch, so before March. Um, and two after. 
Um, and, and so they'll have a total of four opportunities to um, opt out if they do not want to become a San Diego Community Power customer or opt up if they'd like to receive that higher level of renewable energy. Um, and so there'll be uh, two or four total enrollments for each phase uh, for each customer. So there, there will be a lot of enrollments going out. Um, and that's definitely something that um, San Diego Community Power is bringing on uh, staff to assist with. It'll be a long, un large undertaking. Um, but, but they're um, working hard towards it. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, you know, as I say, working hard, um, some of the, the recent improvements or uh, recent activities that they've uh, undertaken are um, beginning to hire some full time San Diego community power staff, um, which is great. Uh, they have a, an interim CEO of uh, Bill Carnahan, um, and, and he's worked to lead and start other CCAs, so he has a wealth of information um, and, and has, has been really great in the conversations that he's had with city staff, as well as Cody Hooven uh, from the city of San Diego will be their chief operating officer, uh, which is great. She, she was really instrumental in the formation of uh, the feasibility study for San Diego, as well as San Diego Community Power. And has a lot of institutional knowledge that will be really great going forward, um, and then followed by some um, some uh, program staff and executive assistants. But um, a, a lot of staff that are working really hard to put all of these opportunity or all of these you know ideas and plans into place, and and make sure all the regulatory steps are are being followed. Um, looking at this timeline, um, we we they haven't set yet. Set, set rates yet, but that will be coming shortly for those March 1st customers. Um, and then uh, before each phase rolls out, they'll um, set rates to accordingly. Um, uh, yeah, like I said, it, we're, we're, uh, they're, they're getting closer and there's, like I said, making sure that there's a, a clear plan in place uh, before the launch. Um, they will be presenting to city council, to Chula Vista City Council, in early February before the March launch, um, just to provide as an information item to provide information about the services that they'll be providing and, and a little bit of an introduction. Um, and if there's interest, we can also see if um, San Diego Community Power Staff would be able to come to the Sustainability Commission um, before that or um, at a future date um, uh, if there's interest. Uh, next slide. So, um, just wanted to the, before I, I finish. Just wanted to kind of um, provide some information on some of the what I'm calling items of interest, or you know, as as we've been following, staff have been following um, some of the committee meetings, some of the uh, or the uh, the topics that they've been discussing, um, and that will be in future board meetings. Include um, a feed-in tariff, which is a um, a, a rate for small um, energy producers that aren't typically at a very large scale. Um, and this allows them to uh, provide um, uh, energy and um, a lot of co-benefits. Um, a lot of times these can be also um, um, situated in um, brown or uh, uh, previously developed areas of the city and, and really close to the consumers. Um, and the picture that we have in here is from a, a Marin Clean Energy Industrial Park uh, feed and tariff project. Um, and they've been really successful in other um, CCAs and, and a really good um, business opportunity for the local business community. Um, you know, it, they might not own a, a large solar power, a power plant, um, but they have a, a little space in one of the member communities and it kind of allows them a foot in the door. Um, so that's something that we're very excited about. As well as net energy metering and um, adopting rates and policies that allow customers to um, get a fair return for the solar energy that they are providing San Diego community power. Um, and so that's something that they'll be discussing at their next uh, board member board meeting, um, as well as the inclusive and sustainable workforce policy. You know, they're, they're a relatively small group right now, but they're going to be growing over time and they want to make sure that's done in a um, inclusive um, at way, which I, I think is um, very important. Um, you know, going through the, the logo design process and, and as you can see, um, when you look at the logo. Um, they, they really do view community as a really important component of um, their operations. And so they want to make sure that their workforce um, is responding to the needs of that community. And that, again, that we're, the, the workforce is inclusive of the, all the community members, um, not just kind of the, the largest uh, players. Um, and then finally, um, there's lots of regulatory actions. As a new organization, 
Um, there's been some precedent set by the other CCAs, but um, that being said, uh, San Diego Community Power is the largest um, CCA to be launched in SDGs wow. service territory. Um, and so there will, you know, there needs to be a lot of uh, behind the scenes um, regulatory action. And I know that the consultants for San Diego Community Power have been working really hard, holding lots of uh, meetings with uh, judges and, you know, making the case for um, what they see as a fair playing, fa play fair playing field in the regulatory space. Um, and that's something that um, uh, Carolyn uh, will or can speak to a little bit at the end here, but um, I, you know, I think that will be an ongoing kind of uh, engagement that from uh, San Diego Community Power and, and the regulators and, and kind of working to make sure that again, it's a, a fair balance for all um, rate pairs. Um, next slide, and this will be my, my last slide. Um, just wanted to provide information or if anyone would like to learn more, um, participate in the board meetings. They have recordings. Um, they have all their presentations for their committees uh, presentations up on the their website, sdcommunitypower.org, um, and they have a, a lot of really great information up there. Um, so just wanted to kind of end with that. Um, you know, if there is other questions um, for staff, uh, we, we'd love to take them. Um, but I did also want to. Uh, allow uh, Carolyn Schofield, a representative from Chula Vista's or. One of Chula Vista's community advisory committee members um, to speak and uh, provide a little bit of um, information about her efforts with San Diego Community Power so far. Hi. Thanks so much for good evening, commissioners, and thanks so much for um, having me this evening. And I wanted to, I'm a part of the, as Corey said, the community advisory committee from Chula Vista, along with Ed Lopez, and he will be here at a later date, but not this evening. But we meet on the 2nd Fridays of the month. And I also wanted to let you know that in the comment section on your agenda on the um, agenda under number 2, I put some links in there for a couple things that I'm going to talk about. I think you have to copy and paste them. I don't, I don't think they're live when they're in that, in that format. But first, I wanted to share a couple of comments that um, our interim CEO, Bill Carnahan, shared about coming on board with San Diego Community Power. And he was asked, you know, what, what did he notice? And he said that the shared enthusiasm among everybody on the committees and the board of directors and he also mentioned what a good job San Diego Community Power had done to date with getting everything up and running before they had a CEO. So I thought that was really good. Um, what I wanted to speak to tonight was a couple different issues about San Diego Community Power. And then a third um, kind of outside issue that we talk about behind the scenes, but we haven't talked about at a meeting yet. So. Um, as we heard, San Diego Community Power is coming to town and we are on track and so we're really excited about that. But we have a while to wait, so what are we gonna do? So one of the things that we talked about is that while we're waiting, we can work on some of these issues with the regulations and legislation. And so the first one I just wanna remind you about is the PCIA. So that is the power charge indifference adjustment. And I did put a link to um, some information about that. And that is actually being handled right now by Cal CCA. So Cal CCA is the um, trade organization for community choice energy in California. And this is a statewide issue now. And the PCIA or known as the customer indifference is a charge that it's overseen by the Public Utilities Commission, but the purpose is that, um, that the customers that remain with SDG&E while others leave for San Diego Community Power aren't overcharged for the long time contracts that have been purchased ahead of time for our use. I'm turning my, I don't know if my volume's okay, but I turned it up a little bit. 
but it's adjusted annually. And to give you an example, I have EcoChoice, the EcoChoice program. And so I am charged a PCIA fee and it was set, it's set when you leave. So it was set when I changed programs and that's going to be the fee that I have. It's calculated very roughly, it's more complicated than this, but it's the actual portfolio cost for SDG&E minus the market value. So here's the concern. The market value of renewable contracts is decreasing. Good, right? We want lower costs, but that makes the PCIA go up. And so we have cost, we have volatility, and we also want transparency. So that's one of our, um, one thing on our list, and that's what CalCCA is working on. And when we have any actions, we'll be asking, we'll be asking um, our community for help if we need letters and for people to speak up. And then the second item is about the California Energy Commission, and it's about 2022 building energy efficiency standards. And so there's um, a group right now, there's a lot of talk about electrification. And once we have more renewables and the price of electricity comes down, moving toward cleaner buildings, because buildings are number three. So transportation is number one, as far as our greenhouse gas emissions, electricity is two. And then in cities, it's buildings that are number three. And so that's a big issue right now. And last week, so a lot of people gave a lot of input and they thought that the um, California Energy Commission was on the verge of going ahead and making a decision about it. They didn't do that last week and that most likely they may do it on the next cycle. So the, they make their decision in July and then we think that it's probably going to be a couple years after that but a lot of people are advocating for that, including um, the California Air Resources Board. So that's, that's, and that's for a first time. So one of the themes right now is everybody working together in order to move forward. So that's exciting, um, something that's coming up. So the last thing I wanna talk about was some comments made by Bill Carnahan about the importance of us working together with SDG and E. And that's really the best way for us all to move forward. And one of the things he said is he really wants us to know and for our community to know that we are not a threat to SDG and E shareholders. So right now, um, in fact, this is a figure that I got today from Climate Action Campaign, but they said SDG and E is making about a million a day from their operations that don't involve the renewable contracts. So that's one role that we can have when we talk to our communities is, you know, is to talk to them about that. And then um, the next, the next issue is just our portfolio and their portfolio in general. So they have solar contracts and we'd like to enter into agreements with them so that as customers move over to us, we can get solar contracts from them instead of having to go out on the open market. And so that's, that's a really important issue. And finally, future projects. So CCAs in California do tend uh, to do projects with their IOUs. And we think that that's really the best way. I mean, we share a customer base, so we think that that's the best way for all of us to move together and move forward. So um, a couple things that we're talking about for actions right now is to reach out to elected officials and just talk about SDCP and that you're in favor of it. We have a new supervisor, Nora Vargas. So if you're in contact at all with her office or, or know her. Also, we have a new council member for District 4, Andrea Cardenas. And it would be great if we could reach out and I'd be happy to help in any way, go to meetings, um, you know, set up things if you, if you need help. And then finally, reach out to our community. And just in general, Talk, you know, really talk it up. It's coming. It's coming soon. 
and we're really excited about it. We're the only CCA that has the goal of 100% clean energy by 2035, and the hope they're hoping to actually do that sooner. And we also want to hold our IOU accountable and you know to be transparent and to work together with us. So if you have any questions, I can I can answer some of them, but Corey might be able to do a better job with that. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, John. Yeah, th there was a timeline for when customers will be coming onto the system. Uh, what's the status of finding contracts, and particularly what's the availability of uncommitted uh, renewable energy? Uh, as as the board's looking for what sources of getting the, the energy that we plan to buy. Um, okay, let me take some notes so I can get back to you on this too. But the source of the contracts, yeah, I the, 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 the availability of renewable yeah. energy uh, for contracting. It sounds like there's some desire to buy it as a subcontract from SDG. &E. I think I heard you say that. Uh, yes. So, so I, the question is whether, whether the, that market has been explored yet. Uh, Getting ready to start selling energy January 1st. Uh, how much do you have actually you can sell? <laughs> okay. Yes. And what I and what I heard is that, that there's a challenge right now, and they are they do want to buy from SDG and E incrementally, but that there's a challenge with that. And so it, yeah, that's 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 a difficult thing. That's the reason I was curious where it's standing. Yeah. 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 You know, so I, it's, it's, but I believe they, and they did file, they filed with the CPUC because they were short with a little bit short with the resource adequacy, I think. But I don't know what the status of that is because I haven't actually heard about the contracts, but I will um, look into it and get back to you with more specifics. And Corey, part of I don't it, know. If yeah, you know. no, I was just say part of it is that um, because it's all contract negotiations, they, they can, they can tell us or we know about when they release an RFP or an RFO um, and, and they've, they've released a number of those a few months ago. Um, and then we kind of know, you know, when, if they are talking with a few people or, and then we, we learn the most once they've been selected and they can provide all of the details. Um, so, so from what we've heard, like I said, there have been a few um, RFPs that they've put out into the community as well as responding to um, uh, some of the utilities RF, uh, or RFPs, I guess it would be, um, on, on their existing energy, um, and they're they're kind of working to uh, bridge that gap. But it's it's something that they're um, they're kind of working with now, and and they feel that they'll be able to do that. Thank you. So, yeah. Chair, before we go into more questions, we we need to have a two minute pause for the public to submit comments. Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, does the committee have, so before the committee has more questions? Yes. Sir. Yes.
There is one comment in favor. Okay. Would you please announce for the record the, the numbers of comments? Oh, you already did. Okay. Do commissioners have any comments or questions? So, Ed, didn't you say you had a comment or question? Yeah, I do. I, I was just, um, I remember last year and your part when we were discussing various um, projects here. We had some subcommittees and we met with council members. Um, I don't know how we can do it now under COVID, but I think it would be a good idea if we could meet with our new council member, Andrea Cardenas. Um, just, and, or maybe we could just invite her uh, to one of our meetings. It'd be nice. Um, just kind of bring her up to speed on some of the things we're doing uh, here on this commission. Would that be something that the CAP could arrange? The, the, the um, your committee? I guess me. Um, yeah, or or maybe Caroline, is that what you were referring to? Yeah, yeah, I I can um, we you can let me know or you can let me know who wants to meet. I can set up a meeting. I can go to the meeting too if you would like. I think I think that would work fine. Sure, I would I would um like to meet her and any other members or. I said we can also bring her on to our meeting, but uh, just kind of bring her up to speed on um, what you're doing, Caroline. And also want to appreciate all the work and effort you've done here, mm -hmm. um, not only here but also with the the working group, but specifically um, on this CCA CC. Thanks. Um, so I do have, Carolyn, I do have a question um, that I was just wondering if you knew for the indifference adjustment, the approximate estimate that they're coming up with right now, the figures, do you have any idea? No, but I'll, I'll tell you that that's why the, um, the price is being figured out in January. They had to wait until January because there's something going on right now at the California Public Utilities Commission. And okay. so that is going to come out um for sure then because we'll know more so i can um i mean i was thinking i don't even know what my own i should look on my own bill but because they don't send me the paper i don't even see don't it even yeah think about it. yeah so okay. um yeah that's that's a good uh but i think that's when we're going to we'll know more okay Thank so you. So I'll look into both of those things, and um, if anyone else wants to go with us, just maybe you could just let Ed know. That's probably the easiest. And Ed and I, we I'll get together with you, and we can figure out uh, when we can go. I also and want to make one comment on the logo. I love the logo, and I love the fact that um, each color represents a different city. Uh, that is a part of the whole program. So it, it's, I don't know if everyone knew that, but that was, um, that's pretty special. Uh, so you guys did a good job on that. So thank you, Corey and Carolyn. Really appreciate it. Um, all the updated information. Uh, let's see. And so no one else has any questions. We'll move on. Thank you so much, guys. Okay, the next item on the agenda is item number three under action items, the Chula Vista Climate Equity uh, Index findings. The staff have a presentation. Yes, pulling it up right now. Okay. Be giving you a double dose of Corey today, back-to-back -back presentations. <laughs> Excellent. It's a good, you know, I was telling, talking um, with some stakeholders um, earlier, you know, it's kind of good to, I like finishing 2020 with some really good work, um, some great sustainability kind of projects that are being tied up here. So, um, Bill, 2020, I don't think, I don't think the climate equity index will quite um, eclipse, eclipse COVID, but hopefully um, there'll be some good kind of things that come up. So thank you all very much again for allowing me to present on the Chula Vista Climate Equity Index. Um, next slide. Uh, so, um, this is a, a, a an ongoing effort that the city has been working on with stakeholders for um, a few months now, since the beginning of the year. I'll provide some background on um, the effort, some of the methodology for the analysis, 
Um, and we also have um, USD's um, uh, Epic, uh, who have been some uh, consultants helping with this, if there are some more uh, technical methodology questions. Um, and then we'll look at the um, index map and the scores and, and talk about next steps. Next slide. Uh, so for um, background, um, it, it's important to say that this is, you know, not necessarily the city's first effort to um, make our community more equitable. Um, it was definitely something that stakeholders raised as a concern in our climate action planning process through the climate change working group and, and other um, talks with community stakeholders and organizations in our community. Um, and in the past, it's been a real challenge to quantify locally. Uh, the state has a, a really great tool called Encalum Virus Screen, um, but when you kind of look at their most affected areas, um, it, it, it's a, a rather sliver area of Chula Vista, um, and there's a lot more that goes on, and we know a lot more goes on around those areas that helps impact this. So this is kind of a little bit more of a local um, a study at some uh, using some of the, the methodologies from the statewide tool. Um, it also builds upon existing equity efforts. So, you know, there are there are a number of um, actions in the current climate action plan that talk about equity um, and promote equity, um, whether that be um, you know through energy efficiency of buildings that reduce utility bills, um, outreach efforts, weatherization programs, etc. Uh, we've also adopted a digital inclusion plan that provides um, information and you know is, is really timely now that so many more people are using digital um, access to reach um, their work and um, these meetings and public other other efforts of public life and so that digital inclusion plan um, uh, has been adopted uh, there's long um, ongoing support from our, our housing section um, and the number of programs that um, that they host um, and the ongoing so great support that they provide to community members, whether that be first time home buyers, rentals, um, uh, you name it, they, they provide a lot of really important support. And we hope to expand that going forward um, with more sustainability and um, housing uh, work programs that are working together. Um, and then the last two efforts are, that I think are important to highlight are um, the, the welcoming city proclamation and efforts that the city has been taking. Um, you know, I, I think that um, while this plan didn't necessarily look at different types of um, uh, people of color or populate or communities of concern, you know, I, I definitely think that um, immigrant communities that are coming here are, are extra susceptible to a lot of the same issues that we'll be looking at today. Um, and so it's great to see the city trying to support those communities. Um, and finally, the, the new um, uh, library sustainability energy kits. Uh, these are home kits that residents can check out from the library to take home to learn how they can reduce their energy bills. Um, and, it, you know, again, kind of going to the, the, um, the core focus of the library to provide these services to all residents, regardless of their background. Um, it, you know, it's great to work sustainability into that core mission as well. Um, and similar to the energy uh, and water uh, labs that are currently um, educating, um, I believe it's fifth and sixth graders at the Chula Vista libraries as well. So again, providing that kind of education to all community members, um, which is, is really great. Um, also wanted to just um, set your uh, set expectations for what I'll be talking about today. Um, though there's really kind of two core elements um, that I'll be talking about. One is the EPIC findings. Uh, that was what was uh, sent to you and attached to the agenda. Um, this is kind of the, the core findings of the analysis, um, and that will be presented with the full city report, um, which is basically the, the findings with more background information, um, recommendations about next steps, um, and um, more graphic kind of uh, uh, charts and graphs that make it um, more pleasing to the eye and kind of help uh, an executive summary to help um, residents that are skimming through it kind of get the, the really important pieces. Um, that piece we're still working on with our communications department and we, we won't be able to present today, um, but we'll present some elements of that full study. Um, and if there's additional information that you'd like to um, provide us about it, uh, please, you know, it'd be, we'll, we're happy to take those um, uh, information now. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so a, another, you know, really important background that I think is important to look at, you know, why, why, why did we take this effort? And, you know, it, it wasn't just to, um, you know, because stakeholders wanted us to take it and the stakeholders didn't just want us to take it um, to go through the process. Um, it's because there has been historic inequality um, in our communities, broadly speaking, um, whether this be is, um, uh, you know, kind of the more black or more, more clear issues to see, um, like some of the redlining maps that we've recently been seeing for some of the larger metropolitan areas of the nation um, and how those can, you know, even though they, they might be repealed, they can still have impacts generations down the road, um, whether that be um, Ayama versus Cal v. California, uh, which is actually a Chula Vista resident um, who, who lost his property um, during Japanese internment um, and sued the state of California and was a, um, a, a groundbreaking court case that then went on to impact uh, Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, and again, you know, it's something that happened right here in Chula Vista in our own backyard um, is, is playing a role at the national level for things that, you know, are really foundational now. Um, or whether that be, you know, siting of pollution causing activities, whether that's, um, you know, um, uh, freeways or um, industrial uh, components of the region and kind of where those go ha has historically been um, not always the, the most transparent or, or equal process. Um, and those have impacts to today. Um, you know, it's not like redlining. It's not necessarily something that well, the maps are no longer in use, so we're, you know, it's it's kind of done. Um, we see the impacts of that um, today. Uh, and the chart that I have here is just looking at different household um, income gaps as well as wealth gaps. Um, and I, to me, the one that's really striking is the wealth gap. And I, I was looking um, online for it. The um, now the Museum of Us, formerly known as the Museum of Man, had a really great exhibit about the wealth gap in our country. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's numbers, it's facts, it's, there's no interpretation of it, it, it just it, it is an outcome of our system. And so, you know, I, I think it is kind of taking all of these, um, these, this information um, into account is, is really important and, and really um, just, uh, you know, makes this type of effort very necessary. Next slide. Wanted to update um, or provide a timeline. Like as I, as I said, we've been um, working on um, this for about uh, six months now. Um, we started with um, convening regional stakeholders um, in uh, July, um, working with consultants uh, at the University of San Diego to um, uh, gather and analyze data and, and kind of work with our stakeholders to determine what are the really important pieces of, of data that we want to work uh, that we want to look at and include in this study um, and that it, it sounds very easy as up there on one bullet point but it was a you know there's a lot of conversations that go into that as you can imagine um, and so it did take us a, a while to finalize those indicators um, conduct the analysis in september and october um, presenting that to the stakeholders um, and then um, now we'll now um, bringing uh, in november we brought it to um, uh, the stakeholders, um, and now we'll be bringing the the findings to the Sustainability Commission as we're drafting that full city report. And like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll um, pre present on some of the elements in that report as well. Next slide. And then going forward, we'll, we will be um, uh, sending the report back to, or to the stakeholders to get feedback once we do have a, a draft of that, um, and then presenting the full report um, with this findings as an attachment to city council publishing online um, and then working to implement the recommendations and really put the map kind of in um, and, and get it in action um, and present it to city city departments as well as other community members um, connected to the, the previous presentation. Uh, San Diego Community Power has expressed interest in using this map as a way to help prioritize investments in our community as well. So. It's not even fully finished yet, and there's already um, organizations that are looking to leverage it. So I think that uh, is great to see and, and really help uh, encouraging that there'll be um, ways to put this um, into practice. Next slide. 
so uh, here is a list of all of the community stakeholder members that I mentioned when I say community stakeholders. Um, it, it's a, a really uh, great group of all volunteers um, that I cannot thank enough. Um, you know, as someone who um, hasn't been as uh, informed or involved with equity um, efforts in the past, um, they really guided the way for me, and I I just tried to get out of the way and. Um, listen to what, what the information they were saying, and, and they had a lot of really great information about our community um, and about the, the process in general. So, um, you know, I'll thank them a lot because they, they definitely deserve it. Um, and we'll be hearing from um, Fabiola later um, from the Center of Sustainable Energy from a perspective from them as well. Um, and for those who weren't able to make meetings, we really try to um, have email, get surveys, and other ways to get information. Next slide. Perfect. So, jumping now into a little bit of the actual study um, and the climate index process, um, how it, how we created the climate and equity index score is um, based on census tracts and based on um, indicators. So, as the chart um, shows here, the first step is that determine indicators, which is, um, like I said, it that took uh, about three or so meetings before we were able to really determine the indicators that we felt were most re reflective of Chula Vista and the climate risks that we're seeing. Um, EPIC uh, from University of San Diego did a, a great job of collecting data, um, calculating values for each um, indicator in each census tract, standardizing those, um, and then averaging them um, by the census tract um, so that each census tract has kind of a, a, a climate equity index score. And we'll, we'll We'll touch on that a little bit later, but um, basically the, they, they took the list of priority indicators that we gave them and work that into a, um, a climate equity index score that we'll see here. Next slide. Perfect. So this is just a map of the census tracts, kind of the, the basic unit that we were using for this study. Um, you know, I, I think. Ideally, it would be really interesting to get some more granularity um, and to be able to look at how the communities work within these census tracts. Um, but this is, uh, generally speaking, the kind of the the the, the most detailed uh, area that we could get um, the available or the required data for. So that's what we we used as kind of the the level of detail there. Next slide. Uh, then these are, this is a list of the indicators. As I mentioned, it, it took about three meetings to select the final list. Um, the indicators were selected on uh, the relevancy to the community um, and climate, as well as data availability. Um, so again, we wanted to make sure that we could get data on all of these and, and we were able to. Um, the, the broad categories are uh, environmental indicators, uh, the largest section, health indicators, mobility indicators and socioeconomic indicators. Um, so these are the kind of the, the core that the score is looking at. Um, and you can also on our online map kind of dig in a little bit deeper and look at each one of these per census tract. So kind of um, if you want to look into the, the climate equity index more, these are the, the different layers that you can look at. Next slide. On top of the indicators, there were some other really important data that just for one reason or another didn't um, fit and we, were, we weren't able to incorporate it as an indicator, um, but we wanted to provide it as an additional overlay. So um, I, I think a good example is the COVID cases um, um, because that, that data um, didn't have, um, I forget the, the specific reason why we weren't able to include it. Um, but when you look at the, the, the map, we can overlay kind of the number of COVID cases with the climate equity index scores. So we can see um, in, in generality, um, you know, how they're interacting with each other, even though we weren't able to incorporate it into the, um, the climate equity index. Um, so for, for the, these additional data, um, as you see, the reason we weren't able to would be if the data reflected general population um, characteristics, uh, and this is um, as noted there, the, the race and ethnicity data. Um, if it was incompatible with geographic scale, um, I think that might have been the um, COVID cases because they were at the census or the, the zip census, or sorry, uh, the zip code, not census track. 
Um, and then if the data quality concerns, um, that data is only available at the, yeah, so it's the census track. So the graphic scale there again, um, but these are a, additional uh, overlays that we'll be um, looking at and that you can look at online. Next, next slide. So this is just a little bit of a um, example or a demonstration of how they create, um, you know, how multiple indicators get fed into one average score. Um, and so what they use or what, what Epic created or used was um, the Z score, um, which is measuring um, how far that given value is from the average for that indicator. So, you know, even though housing costs and open space are, are different um, indicators, we're still able to ma measure how far that census track is from the average and, and use that as a way to um, bring multiple indicators together. Um, and you'll have that census track score. Um, so just wanted to provide that. Um, and next slide. And now we'll look at um, some of the, the final presentation or the, the, the climate index map. Um, so this is um, a, an example of the looking at all the scores where we're seeing the highest 25% um, of census tracts are in that darker or the bluish color um, with the light green being the uh, lower score or indicating that they had the, the least amount of um, climate um, equity impacts in the, those communities. I, I think this aligns a lot with what we've currently seen from Cal Enviro screen. Just for context, um, on, on the left here, that line between the kind of blue and the, the teal color um, is Broadway. And so, you know, traditionally what we've seen looking at Cal Enviro screen is that, you know, this is where the majority of the disadvantaged communities are. But I, I think that this map really does show that there is other communities and there's a spectrum of communities within Chula Vista um, and that some other communities that maybe weren't as um, easily identified in previous maps um, are identified here, such as the southern portion and, and the, the northern uh, kind of northern western portion um, here, but also the the kind of the um, the mid ranges, which I, I think are really important as well. Um, so, like I said, this is a um, a draft version of the slide. One thing that we are still um, uh, very open for input on is the color schemes of the map. Um, this is one color scheme. Uh, if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> uh, this is a, a different color scheme based on the um, Cal Enviro screens colors that they use for their statewide map. Um, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll still be uh, sharing these with our stakeholders and, and getting some final inputs before it's presented to city council. Uh, but that is uh, definitely something that um, we're interested in taking input today. And um, if you don't, uh, provide it now, feel free, you can provide it at any time um, before the end of the year, and we'll be happy to to take that um, um, information in. Uh, but again, you can see, you know, it's the same information, but just slightly different um, a look to it, uh, but you can see that there um, uh, is uh, uh, a wide range of impacts. Next slide. Um, so, as I mentioned, there is also an online map that residents can go to and look at um, the total climate equity score, but they can also look at the individual scores for each of the indicators that are, go into this map. Um, and so uh, currently it's it's online at the US um, UC San Diego website. Um, we'll be transitioning this over to the city's website, um, but wanted to provide both those links um, and you'll be able to see. Uh, oh, actually, just uh, one. One past or one back, please. Um, you'll be able to see not only the raw climate equity score, um, but also the normalized score based on other um, census tracts in the community. So on the on the the, the table here on the right, um, that's kind of just the raw um, data for you know for the first one. That's the air quality, um, and that's what it is. Uh, that that point oh uh, zero point zero four number. Um, but then the number to the right of that is what the normalized score is based on other census tracts. So, um, you know, this, that, that 0 0.04 might not look like um, it, it has a, it's very high number, but it's actually the, the, in the, one of the highest numbers in our, um, in the, in, in Chula Vista. So you can kind of see where, you know, drinking water contamination, much higher number, but it's actually a lower impact 
related to um, Chula Vista numbers. So there's a, a lot of information um, that um, we'll be providing um, about all of these index and the scores on the online map as well. Next slide. Uh, and then this is an example uh, from the online map of some of the overlays so oh, that I mentioned. So for example, um, when looking at funding, we know that even though this is our climate equity map and for our funding decisions, this is what we will use. But for you know working with like the state or other organizations that use slightly different um, metrics to look at their funding, um, we can overlay those on our map. So for example, the, the dark blue there represents the um, uh, Cal Virus Green traditionally disadvantaged communities. It's that kind of narrow sliver along um, west of Broadway um, with the more encompassing um, low income communities definition there too. So we'll be able to overlay this to see how the state's definition aligns with our definition. Um, and, you know, if there's if it's a state grant we're going for, We'll make sure that it's in one of these areas um, and that our kind of that our tool aligns with the state's tool because one of the goals is to get more funding and grants for these neighborhoods. So we want to make sure that um, it's easier to apply for those. Uh, next slide. Um, and then looking at some of the, the race and ethnicity demographics analysis of the study, um, th they did find that there was um, um, a, a difference or an impact um, based on race um, with their findings of uh, persons of color, uh, non-white and Hispa um, white Hispanic populations make up a higher percentage of the overall population um, in the census in the, those census tracts with a higher um, climate equity index score. Um, so you can, if you follow the, the um, uh, white Hispanic population, uh, you can see at the, the lowest impacted um, communities, they make up 40% of the population, but in the highest impacts, that raises, rises to 57%. So there is some of those analysis that are impacts that they were able to see. Uh, they also conducted some analysis on um, based on age and, and did not see any correlation there. So um, yeah, this, um, yeah, it's it's very interesting, and um, we'll be working with our communications team to kind of create some graphs that will help um, kind of bring out some of those uh, important points from this analysis here. Um, next slide. Um, and finally, I wanted to mention and talk about some of the reports, the the full city report elements um, that will be presented to city council um, and present some of those the the big elements that will be included in that report. Um, one of them, I, I think, is uh, just an, an F definition for climate equity. Um, and I do have one slight tweak to this definition, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll call that out as I read it. Um, it's um, addressing historical inequalities suffered by people of color, allowing everyone to, to fairly share the same benefits and burdens uh, from climate solutions and attain full and equal access to opportunities um, and this is the addition to that will be um, including decision making, uh, regardless of one's background and identity. Um, I, I think it sounds, you know, kind of good or you know pretty general when you're you're thinking about it, uh, but I do think it's also really important to to include this definition, um, and and to really kind of ground why we're looking at this index, um, and it is again because of these historical inequalities. Um, in our efforts to share the benefits and burden from climate solutions, uh, I, you know, I, I think there's there can. It sounds a little bit weird to say benefits of climate solutions, but you know, I, I think that one of the great examples of that is um, like the electric vehicle um, incentives, um, and some of the studies and some of the recent changes to that program of providing um, ha uh, higher incentives for lower income residents. Uh, because traditionally, you know, they would tend to go for tend to go to the higher income individuals that are purchasing, you know, luxury electric vehicles. Um, and so the state kind of recognized that and, and made those tweaks to say, yes, this is something that is important. So there can be benefits and burdens from climate solutions. Next slide. Uh, this, the full report will also include um, uh, some city recommendations. Uh, these are the, the three recommendations that we have, um, and these were, and I should say, um, this, the city of San Diego completed a climate equity index um, last year, 
Um, and this uh, study, as well as uh, the report and the recommendations are kind of building off of that and using that as a example. I think they did a really good job. I would um, give them a, a big um, congratulations for the work they're doing. Um, and so if you look at their recommendations and our recommendations, I, I, they'll be pretty similar. Um, but our, what we want to do is um, increase outreach to and engagement with high scoring census tracts. So we want to raise um, the voice of those community members, reach out to them and provide them the information that they need to make sustainable and to take advantage of um, programs related to climate change. Uh, seek funding to put those programs into place because you know there's a lot that we can do with you know just our existing efforts, but um, a, a lot more that can be done with um, once we find funding to um, expand those and then update the climate equity index. Um, one of the reasons that we did select the data that indicators that we did were was because they get updated about every five years. So this will give us an opportunity to about every five years update this map <clears throat> and see how the actions uh, that we're doing are affecting our community um, and have a clear path to monitor that. So um, that's something that we would like to do as the data is available. Um, next slide. And so just wanted to finish, um, well, before our, uh, my last slide, uh, we'll just be reminding you all of the timeline that will be coming up. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll be approving the, the report, uh, providing feedback and approving the report today. Um, and then we'll take it to um, city council um, or take all that feedback, um, create the full report, um, send it to the stakeholders, present it to city council, um, and publish it online and, and get it out into the community and work to um, present to the community as well as um, you know provide more resources to the community as we best can. Um, so with with all of that kind of background information, um, I, I wanted to um, also um, have uh, provide an opportunity uh, for Fabiola from the Center for Sustainable Energy to uh, speak a little bit about her effort as a stakeholder. Um, in this process and some of the, the um, uh, parts that were important to her. Hi, can you hear me all right? Excellent. Okay, well, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. I'd like to start by thanking the Sustainability Commission for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, my name is Fabiola Lau. I'm the Senior Equity Policy Manager at the Center for Sustainable Energy. Um, headquartered here in San Diego. Um, I'm also a Chula Vista resident. I actually live in District 2. And as Corey mentioned, I was a member of the Climate Equity Index Stakeholder Group. And as some of you know, also I also sit in the city's Climate Change Working Group. The Center for Sustainability Energy applauds the City of Chula Vista for developing a Climate Equity Index. This will be an important tool in helping the city implement this climate action plan and also focus investments and resources in low income communities and communities of color in the city that have been historically underinvested and marginalized from public processes and funding opportunities. And the climate equity index will help ensure that equity is front and center in policy and decision making as it pertains to the climate action plan. Um, I've been working in the environmental equity space for more than 13 years now, and during the past eight years, I've seen mapping tools with the start of the state's Calum virus screen just, just become essential parts of equity and environmental justice conversations at the California state level and also at the local and regional level. I'd like to point out, point out that I also participated in the stakeholder group stakeholder working group that helped the city of San Diego develop their own climate equity index. Um, yeah, the city of Chula Vista used the city of San Diego's index as a foundation, but I can assure you that the CI shown before you today, it generally reflects and incorporates feedback from Chula Vista, resident, uh, Chula Vista residents and relevant stakeholders. That stakeholder process that has helped Develop, um, developed Chula Vista's Climate Equity Index consisted of a series of meetings where we had robust conversations about various elements of the index. We had in-depth discussions as to which indicators should be included in the CEI, and staff was very receptive to our suggestions and recommendations. We wanted to make sure that the indicators reflected the needs of our community. For example, 
preschool enrollment was incorporated as a socioeconomic indicator based on the feedback from members of the stakeholder group. And I can tell you that this indicator is not part of the City of San Diego's index. And furthermore, I've received comments from other equity and environmental justice stakeholders in the region that the Chula Vista Climate Equity Index does a great job at including such a great variety of indicators that really capture equity. As part of the stakeholder process, we also helped draft the definition for climate equity that Corey uh, covered a few slides ago. Equity definitions that are developed in partnership with community members and stakeholders, as such as the case here in Chula Vista, are another crucial piece of the puzzle in embedding equity from the onset and throughout the policy process and implementation phase. The equi climate equity definition that was presented earlier, it's very similar to the City of San Diego's definition, but it also incorporates feedback from members of the Chula Vista stakeholder group. And now I'd just like to bring your attention back to the climate equity index map. The Center for Sustainable, Sustainable Energy appreciates staff and um, EPIC for providing a map that includes colors that more closely match the colors in the state's Calum virus screen tool. Those are red, orange, green, and yellow. And, you know, I tried numerous environmental equity programs and projects funded by the state. I've been doing this for like more than eight years now. And I also participate in various public processes uh, where these projects are actually being designed and updated. And Calum Virus Scream is the mapping tool that the state uses in its grants to fund projects in disadvantaged and low-income communities as these are defined by, this, um, by the state and defined by legislative mandate, basically. And I think that, you know, it will better serve the city of Chula Vista to have a map that more closely reflects what the state uses. For example, if the city of Chile applies the state grant and includes the climate e equity index map to point out, hey, these are the communities that are we, you know, are, will be benefiting from the, the state funding. If the map shows the colors red, orange, green, and yellow, just like Helen Bioscream, I can tell you that this will better resonate with staff at state agencies. And it, that basically the more congruency there is, the better. Um, and I'd like to finish by uh, recommending to the commission to direct city staff to include that red, orange, yellow, and green color scheme in the climate equity index instead of the blue and teal shades, as this will help the city better position itself when applying for state funding, especially when we all know that resources are very limited these days. Um, the color red should really show those communities in the city with the highest climate equity index scores as those are the communities that have been disproportionately impacted by pollution and poverty. And overall, the Center for Sustainable Energy, we, you know, we support the Climate Equity Index and we recommend for the commission to approve the report and recommend it for city council approval. And now I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions. Does staff have any quick comments uh, they'd like to make before they go to public comment and deliberation? And do the committee members have any questions for the staff? I have a question once you get uh, past the public comment. I will call for a two minute pause to allow the public to submit any final comments on the item before um, deliberation. And Commissioner, as a reminder, to refresh your screen to ensure new comments appear.
Manuel, are there any additional comments? There are four comments in favor. Okay. So do any commissioners have comments or questions? I have a question. Yeah, based on Fabiola's presentation about consistency between various agencies relative to this program, frankly, I, I looked at the city of San Diego's uh, program and I compared it to Chula Vista's and I got confused. So may, maybe, uh, if, maybe I'm not the only one because it looks like what the city of San Diego did, they did the same study that, you, that was done here, came up with the high impact areas and then flipped it over and said, well, those are low opportunity areas. So basically they, they built their entire program around improving opportunities for the high impact areas. So I, I guess the question I have, uh, is, is this is this being consistent with high impact, low opportunity, and which way is the best way to approach the community to say that we're going to address these issues? Is it because of high impact or low opportunity or is, is there been any discussion with the city of, of San Diego as to whether or not there needs to be at least some consistency in the way this is approached? Yeah, so that's a that's a really good question, and thanks for um, looking at that. That was something that we discussed amongst the stakeholder group. Um, you know, I, I can follow up with the city of San Diego to learn more about um, you know their specific reasoning for kind of going from a high index score to a low opportunity. And I, I do think it, you know, part of it is it makes the narrative a little bit easier to talk about and, um, you know, what the potential actions could be. Um, that being said, um, Chula Vista staff, you know, there, that was a um, kind of a, um, that was really like a, a labeling effort um, of their, of their, uh, of their map. Um, and we felt that it was a little bit too far um, to go and, and talk about, you know, opportunities um, because, you know, that's really what this is showing us is these are the high impact areas. Um, you know, city of San Diego took that and, and wanted to go to the low oppor low opportunities. Um, but for, for city Chula Vista staff and um, our stakeholders, we wanted to keep it focused on the index report and, you know, not lose anything in that transition or, or, or translation um, between the scores. We really just wanted to showcase, you know, this is, it is a climate equity index. These are the high um, areas, the high index areas, community areas. Well, Corey, Corey you, met, you, you mentioned at the outset of your presentation that the CCA uh, was interested in using this in some of their programs. So now you, you do in fact have another agency uh, that's now saying maybe we ought to look at this and so maybe the, the, you need to re-examine whether or not this ought to be consistent with opportunities versus impact. How, how does the community power uh, want to use this if, they, if they're going to mix together two different kinds of approaches? It may, may work well for the city staff here, but it may not work well when the community power starts looking at it and seeing two different definitions, high and low, uh, and what and what might need to be the the, the actions that, that would be recommended for that. So, I, I'd, I'd suggest that that needs to be reconciled. We'll we'll uh, we'll take a look at that. Um, but again, it is the number scores that the San Diego Community Power will be looking at. So, not necessarily what we label the numbers as, but they'll be looking at the actual numbers. But but, but there's going to be a high and a low difference, right? I, 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 I'll not I'll not pursue this, but. It just, it confused me and, and you know, I'm a numbers person. So uh, if, if I got confused, there may be other people who will get confused about this as well. We don't want that to happen. Uh, we want some, some good progress on that. Thank you. May I go? Thanks. Uh, I also have a lot of questions and I think all of these numbers are relative values. So when comparing Z scores or index values between Chula Vista and San Diego, it's not exactly apples to apples, right? Because they're all normalized relative to the study region. And I don't know how that will play out in uh, how external agencies view this index and compare it to other regions. Um, so that might be another thing to think about. Um, 
when thinking about how to relate this to other locations or other cities. But I also had a couple of other questions about the indicators that were included. Um, if somebody from the consulting team or the, the staff that was working on this could could address um, there are a few impacts that I think are potentially large and not included, such as changes in precipitation and like water availability, um, not only ocean flood risk, but also extreme event flood risk. Uh, as well as the urban heat island effect. Um, it was made clear in the presentation that there were was a lot of thought and discussion and stakeholder engagement in determining the indices, but I just was curious uh, if somebody could speak to those specifically. And I have further questions, but I'll hold those until after. Yeah, so I don't know. We, we do have some uh, representatives from um, EPIC on the line. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Mark or Namini, that's something that you could speak to. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is Nilmini Silva Zen from EPIC. Uh, those three indicators are basically chosen as the most likely in those areas. So we don't want to choose absolutely all. And then some of them include, like the flood risk, it includes some of those things you mentioned. So I will let Mark explain a little bit more what those three indicators um, contain. That's the first thing. I mean, I'd just like to kind of give a little bit of a response to the previous speaker asking about comparing in indicators. I mean, index, indices across cities is just something we should not be doing. We, this is relative only to within the city of Chula Vista. And so the other thing is there are many, many indices. I don't think the state is going to be looking at this one in particular. This is just for the city and it's relative to things within the city. That's kind of important because you can compare it with the city of San Diego's one or any other index. There's other indices like the California Health, Healthy Places Index. There are, you know, CDC has some other indices. They're all for different purposes and are different. Just wanted to mention that. And, uh, well, I really quickly, I guess that where we compare them is like if we say, you know, the, the top percentage of um, low opportunity projects or high impact uh, areas, um, you know, those kind of that top percentage of projects are something that, um, you know, we wouldn't necessarily compare the scores, but you can right. use the results in, in a, a document together. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mark, would you like to explain a little bit more about the, and these are also projected climate impacts, remember, there we're just, sort of including those with the other indicators that are currently measured. Mark, would you like to, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, oh, okay. We're addressing the specific indicators that you identified, Angelica. Um, those are definitely indicators that we have thought about through the development process. Um, so there are some, uh, the, the flood risk indicator, for example, does capture some of those extreme weather events, both from sea level rise and from precipitation events. Um, so areas that are located within the flood hazard area are more likely to experience um, increased flood damage because of increased precipitation events. Um, the urban heat island index, um, unfortunately, the best data set we have available, it has been developed by the um, Cal EPA. Um, we included that with the city of San Diego's climate equity index, um, and there was actually some significant stakeholder feedback after the fact that it maybe was not um, the most uh, accurate of indicators and what it's trying to represent in that um, areas within the city that are actually more rural were being indicated as having a much higher urban heat island index than, um, say, the downtown area uh, where it was completely urban. So there is some current concerns about the um, quality of the data when looking at such a small spatial resolution. So it may work great when looking at the state um, 
as a whole, but when you kind of go down to just one jurisdiction, it may not be capturing what we would actually expect to see um, from one neighborhood to the next. And so for that reason, we had um, excluded that indicator from um, the index with the hope that if something does better, does come along that's better, we can go ahead and include it um, at a later date. And then for extreme, um, other extreme weather events for um, heat events, for example, um, that is included with looking at the predicted number of extreme heat days um, that we expect to see in um, communities across Chula Vista. Um, for some of the other climate impact indicators that um, something like Caladath does have data for, um, it, it kind of goes back to something similar to the Urban Heat Island Index, where looking at you know, much broader regional scales, you can get a general sense of trends across the state or across the county. But when you can focus in on just um, a single jurisdiction like Chula Vista, then you lose some of that um, kind of change across neighborhoods or communities. And so what the data would actually end up showing is a very similar kind of result or pattern for the whole of Chula Vista. And so it's not really getting to the potential differences that we'd expect to see um, going from one census tract to the next. Thank you. Um, so just to clarify on the flood risk then, the upstream flooding from the precipitation events is actually coming from Sandag. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And then your final point, I think, underscores the fact that this is all relative. <laughs> so, you know, having the same value for every census track does nothing to the to the data, but it doesn't mean that that impact won't actually be felt in the region. It's just Correct. data availability. Correct. Um, There's also that limitation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I uh just wanted to know if it's going to be possible to have any input into the report that gets formed from this study i think it's really important and i think some of the public comments spoke to the necessity to not only address the findings but also how it can be used and how the city is really going to take action on this information that we now have. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll work with Colleen and Manuel um, uh, to uh, see what opportunities there are. But um, yeah, we're, uh, there, there, we can make sure there will be opportunities for you guys to provide input on the report before it goes to city council. Thank you. I have one more follow-up question. Basically, the city also shows that they, they've they got a goal and they recommend that goals of, of a modifying potentially some city programs uh, to account for this index. And I don't see that in the list that, that you presented uh, in, in this particular report. So you, it, it looks like you left that one out. Is that intentional? Uh, sorry, what, what goal was that? It was to modify certain programs within the city or the way in which the resources are allocated uh, based upon that index. In other words, it's another decision factor that would be incorporated uh, with, within the city departments, as best I can tell. I'm not sure what that meant, but that, that's not in the list of things that you showed as recommended action. Um. So, you know, I mean, well, I'd say that one of our first steps once we have a final report will be to share it with city departments um, and work with them to find ways that they can incorporate it into um, into their their work. Is is that what you were um, getting at? Well, the, the report, and maybe I misread the city of San Diego, basically said that was one of the ex expected the recommendations was to do exactly that, to go out and, and make sure that it's incorporated in the city decision making process. So that's how, um, that's how I read it. So you mean in the San Diego um, report? The San Diego that's report? Correct, yes. 
Yes. Yeah, that, that was um, one that we initially had um, as a, a draft recommendation that was shared with the stakeholders. Um, but uh, after talking with city staff, um, you know, or it, it was decided that we really wanted the recommendations to be focused on the communities, not so much what city, you know, that, that should be something city staff do as a part of their regular job. Um, they shouldn't necessarily need an additional recommendation to, to to bring to focus on that. Uh, it will be something that we do, uh, but we wanted these recommendations to really be more community focused and look at, you know, how can we go above and beyond? Well, just, just a little bit of pushback that that sounds like there, there basically is no, there's no meat behind this thing. It's, it's basically you, you're putting out a report that's nice to have, but there's, there's, there's nothing behind it to make a change. That's, that's what it sounds like. All right. I don't mean to overstate it. Oh, no, that, that's really good feedback. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, that was something that was uh, a previous recommendation. Um, and so we'll be happy to kind of share that feedback um, with others at the city and, uh, and and see if there's something that we could put back in or um, address that in some other way. Thank you, that's all. And, hey, Corey, I don't know if it'd be helpful to provide some background information on the City of San Diego stakeholder group um, to answer some of the questions that have been raised by commissioners. Sure. Know. Uh, for me to provide that or for you to provide that, Fabiola? For me, for me to provide that. I don't know if Chair uh, Matias will be okay with that because I think it might help clarify some questions. Yeah, that'd be great to hear. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. So ju just to address the first one that was raised about, you know, the difference on how you're characterizing those high scoring census tracts on the climate equity index. What I would say is that, yes, good observation, Commissioner Richardson, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was also part of the development of that equity index for the city of San Diego. So at the end of the day, what the index are doing is doing the cumulative impacts of all the indicators. And they do match in many ways with the city, I mean, with the state's Kyle and screen indicators are, which is like, these are the communities that are disproportionately impacted with pollution and poverty. Now, what you're right, like the city of San Diego decided to do is to kind of, and what Corey mentioned was to change the narrative a bit, to make it more about, is these communities that have the low access to investments and opportunities? So that's how they decided to kind of switch it around, um, I guess, you know, to make it more in, to some more easy to understand and also to just go back to your comment about making sure that there's some congruency between what we're using regional with the state at least at the state level i can tell you what the map on the slide deck that has the orange yellow and green it really reflects a lot about what's in the state's column virus screen so they'll call, if you keep that color screen it's very similar so it's not you know it's kind of just reinforcing what it's already known about the west side of Chula Vista that historically that's the part of the city that needs the most resources that that's where more redlining is that where more low income communities and communities of color are you know I live on the west side my parents lived on the southwest side of Chula Vista so you know it, it reflects what is we know what's happening on the ground so in that sense it wouldn't be completely off the, you know, difference, but uh, regarding you know what was said earlier about comparing what we have here with in San Diego, just keep in mind that the indicators are slightly different because they incorporate the community feedback to actually demonstrate what is happening in our city that's special to our city, that is specific to our city. And with that said, also just to buy a little um, another piece of information uh, for background for San Diego community power, it was mentioned at a previous meeting, and I think you know Caroline, you can attest to this too for the climate um, for the community advisory committee that she sits on. That right now, San Diego community power in the joint powers authority agreement, they define communities of concern. That's the term that they use, and they're going to be looking at the city of San Diego's climate equity index because, you know, in their index and in the report, they define community of concern. And city, city Chula Vista now has its own climate equity index. They'll be doing the same. But for the other three cities in San Diego community power, La Mesa, Imperial, and Sinidas don't have a climate equity index, and their community power will be using Cal and Virus Creek. So that's kind of where, you know, where you see that there's all these different mapping tools, but the the point of the city of having its own climate equity index is to make it very specific to what's at the local level. 
and I think it's done a really good job of that and still demonstrate the cumulative effects of pollution and socioeconomic factors that kind of all in an aggregate contribute to poverty. So in, in that sense, there's, you know, there's a lot of tools <laughs> going on. You have no idea what my life these days has been like totally all these tools is at the national level or the states are having their own tools, other jurisdictions are having their own equity tools. Sort of like I'm geeking out about this a little bit too much, I think. Um, but it, I, I just think that what the switch office has done is a great aspect. And yes, back to, and then to address what um, Commissioner Rodriguez said, the report will kind of elaborate more on that. And that's what the city of San Diego did. And um, you're right, it does indicate that other the city departments would start using it to implement their own plans. And actually that's what's been happening in the city of San Diego. It started with the office of sustainability using the tools to implement their climate action plan, but now they're working very closely, closely with the planning department as they're implementing general plans and all of um, like the, uh, I forgot what it's called, the parks plan, general master plan. So that was the intent. And I know that's the same intent here in Chile Vista. Thank you, Fabiola. This is an action item, so if there are no more questions. Okay. Okay, so then um, is there a motion to approve the items um, on the climate equity index findings? I so motion. But I may second, but I want to clarify, all we're doing is, is approving the findings. We're not approving the recommendations or what's going to be done with the findings. That's, is that correct? Corey, is that correct? Yes, 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 yes. We're, we'll take an input on the recommendations, but it's really the, the findings report um, that, that was sent to you that you'll be, that you're approving today. It's just the findings report. Not, not, not all the other stuff we talked about. Yes, but we wanted to, um, as we're, we're in the process of drafting the full report, so we wanted to uh, use this opportunity to get some of that important feedback now. If we had a comment on the actual document, how would we submit that? Uh, you can submit that to Colleen or Manuel, um, or um, send it directly to myself um, at uh, my, um, yeah, it's probably easiest just to, to send it to Colleen or Manuel and, and they'll forward it to me. Okay, thank you. Well, then I'll second the motion uh, with the understanding that there will be uh, comments submitted by Mr. Rodriguez as well as this, this is not a proving report, just, just the, the, the results of the, of the study, the, the preparation of the index itself. So I second that. Okay, I have a motion by Legespi and also Richardson. Um, so please, Commissioner, or uh, Secretary, can you please connect? Uh, Chair Legespi, Co-Chair Legespi? Aye. Commissioner Rodriguez? Aye. Commissioner Corgan is absent. Commissioner Guevara Gluyas is absent. Uh, Commissioner Baugh? Uh, you're muted. You're muted. You want to give us a thumbs up? Or? Okay, uh, that's, that's an aye. <laughs> Commissioner Richardson? Aye. And Chair Mathias? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. The Chula Vista Climate Equity Index findings is anonymous, unanimous, and passes. Okay. So let's go with the next uh, item on the agenda is item four under action items consideration of forming an ad hoc subcommittee regarding the climate emergency declaration. So, does staff have a presentation? Hi there. We don't have a presentation, but this is just a um, of the action item that we talked about at the last meeting. So there might be some interest. But this is the action item uh, to form the talks committee. Okay. So let's see. I will call for a two minute pause. I guess that's what's next then. 
um, to allow the public to submit any final comments on this item before commissioner de deliberation. Commissioners, as a reminder, please refresh your view screen to ensure the comments appear. Okay. We can start the timer. Okay. There are no comments in this item for okay. this item. Thank you so much. Do any commissioners have comments or questions? So I would just like to point out we can have up to three commissioners um, that may want to be part of it. Okay. So do we need to take a vote of who wants to participate in it? Or is that what we're supposed to do right now? Um, I believe you can discuss between the members and kind of feel out who might want to do it and then take a vote on that uh, when you're done. Okay. So does anyone have an interest in participating? Um, can you hear me? I had indicated I would be interested. Okay. Okay. I would also be interested. Okay, Rodriguez. Okay, is there anyone else? Oh. Okay. Um, I, I'll move then. We, we create an ad hoc committee. I guess we need to name the commissioners who are going to form that committee as a part of the motion. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that would be key. Okay. But, that we create an ad hoc committee consisting of Commissioners Ball and Rodriguez uh, to, to exa examine the, the potential of creating a climate emergency declaration for the city. That sounds great. So um, I'll take a motion of who would like to approve this. We need a Who's second. Okay? Oh, he did first. Okay, second. I'll second. Yes, me. Okay. So I have um, our ad hoc committee is approved uh, unanimously with Ba and Rodriguez uh, as the uh, participants in this and the commissioners in this. And um, thank you so much. I think you need to take a vote, right? Oh, did yes. we say? Sorry. Yes, we need an actual vote. Thank you. So, who's going to roll call? Commissioner Ba has a question. Actually, uh, there's the, some oh, deliberation. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I thought when we talked about this last uh, month that Commissioner Lagasse had a lot of information about other places that had done something like this then will you be able to contribute anything to this effort? 
Yes. Yeah, you want to be on we'll, also, we'll also have staff as well that can help us as well with this, correct? Yes, yeah, staff will be available to help. Um, I just wanted to confirm that it's just commissioners Ball and Rodriguez that wanted to be on the subcommittee. And that's fine, um, but yes, yeah, staff will be a resource as well. Okay, we, so we could all help. We'll we could hop in and out if we need to, right? Or if we want to. We could all participate. Um, just not all at the same time. It has to be three or less. Yep. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So we have a motion and a second. Now we can take a vote. Okay. So um, all in favor. I will have to roll right. call. You guys have to roll call. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Co Chair Legaspi? Aye. Commissioner Rodriguez? Aye. Commissioner Corgan and Commissioner Guevara are absent. Uh, Commissioner Baugh? Aye. Commissioner Richardson? Aye. And Chair Mathias? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Let's go on to other business. Staff comments. Hi there, this is Colleen. I had a few comments that will be pretty quick. Just wanted to remind everyone, I think you got a flyer about this event coming up uh, via email a couple weeks ago. We have a sustainable holidays webinar taking place this Thursday from uh, 4 to 5 p.m. So it's December 17th. I think you already got a flyer for that. Um, you can register ahead of time or just join when it takes place um, or a few minutes beforehand. That's all in the link that we shared a couple weeks ago. Um, we are having a benchmarking webinar this Wednesday, the 16th at 11 a.m. Um, I can send that link out tomorrow or tonight, either one of those. Um, I don't think we sent that out to you yet, but that is for just folks learn wanting to learn a little bit more about benchmarking. Um, and I know there was a request at our last meeting about an update on what happened to those ordinances you guys worked on over the last several months. So I wanted to give you an update on the two, um, the most recent ones we brought. So I can't even remember when, I'm thinking almost a year ago, we brought the existing home sustainability ordinance. It might've been in January of this year, but um, I know this is a bizarre year to try to track time. Um, that was our residential ordinance um, kind of linked to um, additions and remodels. So that went to the city council. We were slated to go in late February. We were at the meeting for a few hours until they told us it was going to be delayed to the next meeting because it was getting late. So that was the first meeting. Sorry, that was the last meeting in February. We were supposed to go back um, or the beginning of March. At any rate, um, went back. Uh, they had some questions and wanted some uh, modifications to that ordinance. Um, so, and they wanted us to come back in a few months. And then the next week, uh, we all were working from home. So this kind of got shelved for a bit. Um, at any rate, it came back in the fall um, during a meeting like this, a remote meeting with city council. They had some questions regarding ADUs or accessory dwelling units. So staff went back again. Took a couple weeks, kind of did some research, talked to different departments at the city. Uh, but long story short, it was finally approved by city council in December. Um, so that's good news on that one. That has just finally fi finished up with city council. Um, then the other ordinance I wanted to update you on was benchmarking or building energy saving ordinance. Um, you guys um, tackled that over the last couple of months. Um, in order to not confuse council, we didn't want to be taking two different ordinances at the same time. So since the um, single family or the residential ordinance was just uh, approved in December, this one is slated to go at the first meeting in January. That might get pushed depending on what other heavy items get on the agenda, but currently scheduled for, I think it's January 5th, whatever that first Tuesday is in January. So stay tuned for that. We can update um, on that once we get to council and can tell you what happened with that one. And then with that, I'm going to pass it over to Manuel. Hi, good evening. Uh, so in, um, briefly in January 9th, the meeting of January 19th uh, for city council, uh, I'll be presenting 
to to city council on the Senate bill 1383 requirements the organics requirement uh, similar to the report I gave to this commission um, last month. Um, we'll have somebody there also from Cal recycle to uh, further present on some of the regulation that was just adopted uh, at the end of, of November. So it took a few years for them to adopt the regulations at the time where I presented to this commission. The, the, the regulations were not adopted, um, so there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, so it finally got it finally happened um, and and now it's going to be presented to council as well. Um, so, I, and, and um, the other thing is that I would like to uh, remind the commission if you could help us spread the word out to our to residents about Christmas tree recycling uh, that it's, it could be collected at your curb. Um, and uh, it has to be free of any decorations, any plastic. Uh, we just want the, the well, Republic just uh, wants the tree itself and it could just be placed. You don't have to call and schedule anything. Just place it out on the curb. And if you're a, a, a resident of a multifamily dwelling, all you got to do is ask your apartment complex or condo complex manager to to see where to place it. And also, I encourage you to, to uh, if you get a chance to look at some of the articles that were put on the um, uh, clean uh, newsletter that was sent out, one by our very own chair of this commission, uh, which was a great article. There's also a couple of them there uh, with a, a local food rescue organization that that needs help. So if you could also help spread the word out on, on how to help them. Uh, and that's it. Uh, have a happy holiday, everybody, and we'll see you next year. That's it for me, though. There's still <laughs> more in the agenda, sorry. Good evening, uh, Chair Matthias, uh, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, Dennis Kukunga, Chief Sustainability Officer. I'm glad to see everybody is staying safe and healthy. I uh, just wanted to, uh, once again, thank you for your continued leadership. And I did want to share a couple of updates. Um, I had mentioned at uh, one of our last meetings that um, our mayor was selected uh, to join the steering committee for Climate Mayors. Um, I had shared that Climate Mayors was founded in 2014. Uh, it is a bipartisan, bipartisan network of 468 U.S. mayors um, who are committed to fighting climate change. Um, currently, the organization states that they're representing about 74 million Americans across 48 states. Um, so we're very excited to continue to play um, that leadership role. Uh, this past week, uh, we had um, one of our quarterly coordination calls and we had all the participating cities on there. Uh, and we're feeling very encouraged, um, as especially in terms of some of this transition that will be happening um, at the federal level um, and some of the recommitments uh, with regards to um, uh, climate change. The other update I wanted to provide this commission was regarding the uh, San Diego Green New Deal. Um, at the September 14th meeting, the commission uh, discussed the uh, San Diego Green New Deal Alliance and the commission expressed support for the vision. Um, and submitted a letter uh, recommending that the city uh, apply to become a member um, of the alliance. Um, one of the things that was stated in that letter um, is that it would show strong support for climate jobs and justice uh, if the city uh, submitted an application. So we conducted some additional uh, review um, and we do agree uh, that uh, the Green New Deal Alliance aligns with various uh, uh, goals. Um, of, of our climate action, uh, including uh, the, our commitment for 100% renewable energy. However, uh, we noted that uh, the Alliance is an affiliation of community, environmental, and social justice groups. Um, so we don't see an effective or clear role for a government agency such as Chula Vista to being a member. Uh, currently, uh, there are no cities uh, that are members of this Alliance. Uh, we also did not find uh, a, a, a mechanism to be able to become a member, uh, as was recommended in the September Commission letter. Um, however, as desired by the Commission, um, it's clear that the city of Chile Vista could still actively engage uh, with the San Diego Green New Deal. Uh, we could do so by participating in future forums, uh, stakeholder workshops. Uh, we can also, in, also ensure that the Alliance remains engaged uh, in our climate action planning efforts by encouraging them to participate in our meetings. Um, if they can even participate in a sustainability commission meeting, climate change working group and other outreach meetings. We also delved a little, a little deeper into their, into their website um, in terms of how, what are some other ways of getting uh, involved? 
Um, their website lists four um, working groups uh, that um, folks could participate in. Um, the one that um, piqued our interest was the working group around social justice and equity. We see this as, as, an, opportunity, as an opportunity area. Uh, we can focus on this as part of our upcoming CAP update. Uh, we're currently already working with um, the Climate Action Campaign, and the Climate Action Campaign is in a leadership role in the San Diego Green New Deal. So this would be a continuation of that partnership, um, and we could continue to work uh, with them. Um, we also, you also just heard about our efforts around our Climate Equity Index, uh, which again aligns well with some of the um, our goals and visions of that working group. We also see a big opportunity here to continue to rely on the leadership of this commission. Um, you know, as a, as a sustainability commission works with staff when we on, on our climate action, uh, climate uh, our cap update review, uh, we can work together to ensure that the elements that the commission had included in that memo, that those elements are included in this cap update as we take it forward for council consideration. Um, so our goal is to ensure that you know the cap update will include you know clear ways of how we can continue to work with partners such as climate action campaign and the San Diego Green New Deal uh, in our efforts going forward. So we feel that there's still an opportunity to do so, um, and uh, one of the things that we will be requesting um, at a subsequent meeting um, is that um, we 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 take we agendize the item. Um, and we re request that action be taken to uh, withdraw the recommendation uh, for submission uh, as, as, a, as a member. But we will continue to be involved and engaged and participate uh, with the uh, San Diego Green New Deal. Thank and that you. concludes my staff comments. Any, any other staff? Okay, so chair's comment. So thank you so much, everyone. It's been a wonderful year. I know this ends our year, um, but I do want to, on an interesting note for COVID, uh, but I do want to mention that um, COVID has created a plastic disaster, as everyone knows, uh, with especially all the take that's been going on. And so I would like everyone to think about what they're doing when they're taking out their food and opting out. And as you guys, some of you already know, I've already started an opt out campaign right there on takeout plastic. So when you do go to a fast food restaurant or any restaurant for that matter, you know, we just did clean up this weekend and out on the bay, I have pictures of floating condiment packets that were emptied and tossed aside out into our storm drains and gutters um, and ended up in our watershed out in the bay. So I have, there's so many pictures I took with just the plastic, the straws, things like we're going home to eat our food. So just remember that we could talk not, um, we could select and opt out of um, having the restaurants put that into our bags when we purchase. So, um, other than that, that's my only comment, except for thank you so much. The committee's been, commission's been great this year. And um, even with the COVID that's happened, we've been able to manage all um, making a difference. So thank you guys so much. Uh, any commissioners have any comments? Okay, thank you so much. And this concludes, it is 714 and I'm adjourning this meeting to January 11th, 2021 for the next regular meeting of Sustainability Commission in conference, well, not in conference room, um, building A at City Hall, Chula Vista, California. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great year or Thank you. holiday. Thank you everyone, <laughs> happy holidays.